You know, a mother was preparing pancakes for her sons. Kevin, five, Ryan, three, two little boys. They begin to argue over who would get the first pancake. Their mother saw the opportunity, as mothers do, for a moral lesson. And she says, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I can wait. Kevin, the oldest, he turned to his younger brother and he said, Ryan, you be Jesus. <laughs> so how about you and me today? Why don't we all be like Jesus and enforce the non-negotiable boundaries that say, no fear here. This is part four of our series, and I'm excited because I really believe God has given you and I the antidote to fear. You're not called to live under the mantle of fear. God has called you to live fearless and faithful. And this No Fear Here series, we all need to hear it. You know, we've been hearing from so many of you that God is really speaking to you through this series. But some people are like, well, you know, I hear it. I get encouraged. But then Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday comes and I'm starting to feel fear. Well, listen, if you have a headache, you don't just take some aspirin one time just to deal with, well, I had a headache a year ago and I took an aspirin then. I mean, I have a headache now, but hopefully that aspirin a year ago or last week will work. You take it again because you woke up with a headache today. If you're struggling with the fear again, you take the antidote. You go back to the word. You listen to the word. You indulge in it. That's what this No Fear Here series is about. It's not just to be like a a weekend ministry thing. It's to be every day. If you need it in the middle of the night, get up and listen to what speaks to your heart and indulge in the word of God and take God's aspirin for the fear, right? And get it to t go away. And it's a whole lot better than aspirin. That's for sure. So no fear here, part four of our series, and you need to take back your rest. That's what part four is all about. Taking back your rest. God's got a rest for you. Now, we got to review just a little bit. Remember, previously, we learned from the No Fear Here series that fear is enemy number one. It's very, hard, it's very important to understand that. Perfect love evicts, casts down, casts out all fear. We've learned that fear is a talker, right? That's what giants and storms and mountains and problems do. They all want to be heard. But faith is the antithesis to all fear. That's right. Giants, storms, they all have to bow their knee at the voice of faith. Faith is the antithesis of fear and shuts it down with God's spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Thoughts that are set above, not set on what's beneath in a special master class on web, our website, we learn from David the shepherd boy on how to slay the giants of fear. Now, in this exciting segment, we learn about how to take back our rest. That's critical. You've got to take back your rest. You can do it because fear has torment. Remember what 1 John 4, 18 says, fear has torment. The enemy loves to torture people. He wants to torture you, your family, your mind. His favorite tool is F-E-A-R, fear. He often uses a torture technique called sleep deprivation. Did you know that the Geneva Convention and many other countries have banned the use of sleep deprivation as a means of interrogation because they say it's inhumane, it's dangerous. They call it torture. No sleep equals death. Eventually, Without sleep, you die. And the enemy of your soul loves to use sleep deprivation on you. So how does sleep deprivation work? Well, most adults need seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Sleep deprivation does this. It leads you to feeling moody, fatigued, irritable, depressed, forgetful, increased appetite, unmotivated, Tragic accidents involving airplanes, ships, trains, and automobiles, power plants even, a lot of times have been um, the problem, the root of the problem has been linked back to human error because of sleep deprivation. Lowered immune system, increased risk of chronic illness. These are all results of sleep deprivation. Increased fat storage, increased risk of type 2 diabetes, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Negative effects on your hormone production. Mm. You can accumulate what experts call a sleep debt. That must be reconciled. That means paid back. 
increased feelings of worthlessness, inadequacy, low self-esteem, powerlessness, negative effects on your short and long-term memory. That's because of sleep deprivation. Decreased problem-solving ability. Decreased creativity and concentration. Increased anxiety. Poor balance. Man, sleep deprivation. You see, sleep is God's car wash for your brain. God has designed a brainwash, yes, I said brainwash, to happen every night when you're sleeping. This wash removes the toxins and promotes healthy brain functions. Man, isn't God amazing? He's just so good. When you sleep, the cerebrospinal fluid in your body is released around your brain in a pulsing wave action that washes the toxins, the memory impairing proteins from off of your brain. Isn't that amazing? It's phenomenal. The enemy counters that though by using fear, worry to steal your sleep because he knows that this is what God has designed for you. So he wants your brain hot so it's inflamed so the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't, can't pulse around your brain instead of it cooling and going into a restful state. You got to take back your rest. The devil wants your brain toxic, impaired, depressed, and working against you, not for you, but against you. So our enemy's strategy is to steal our rest. The devil wants to steal your rest. He wants to torture you. He doesn't care what the Geneva Convention says. He wants to torture you. So how does he do it? Well, he starts with lies which is simply doubting a truth principle. Does God really love you? Will God really provide for you? Remember the Garden of Eden. Has God really said that? I'm not sure. I think you need to take things into your own hands, Eve, and maybe you should go eat that tree so that you can accomplish God's final outcome for you to be like Him. You know, God takes care of those who take care of themselves. Right? You heard that before? It's just like a little simple twist. God doesn't care about your safety or your family's protection. After all, God created tornadoes, earthquakes, and destructive lightning storms, right? Wrong. It's completely wrong. That's such a misrepresentation of God's character. God is good all of the time. I said in part three, I started off with Psalm 118. It says that give thanks to the Lord for He is good. And his mercy and loving kindness endure for how long? Forever. God's love and his mercy is everlasting. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish. Never build doctrine off of experience. Yours or someone else's. Facts change, but the truth is absolute. Truth is absolute. Never blame death on God who is life. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, when Pam's dad was a little boy, about nine years old, his mom passed away suddenly. It was tragic. She passed away. They were a Christian family. And at the funeral, the pastor came up to Pam's dad, just a little boy, nine years old. And he said, well, he said, Bruce, he said, I guess God was lonely for your mom and he took your mom so that he could have her with him. What a terrible lie to sow into a little boy. Well, as I told you before, when you believe a lie, the thing that comes into your life is fear. Bruce, from that point on, became very angry toward God because he was afraid, he was terrified. He didn't know what moment that maybe God would be lonely for his father, maybe lonely for him, maybe lonely for his sister. You know, that these tragedies were just part of God using tragedies because somehow God was a little bit lonely. Instead of that man telling that little boy the truth of God's word, that God would never leave him or forsake him, that God is everywhere present, that God is with him, that God cares for him, that God sees the tears he's crying. Truth, speak the truth. When you don't know what else to say, speak God's truth. Elijah the prophet, famous prophet, amazing prophet. He had a time when he believed a lie. And then when he believed that lie, guess what happened? He got terribly afraid. And when he got terribly afraid, guess what happened after that? He got so depressed that he became suicidal. 
So let me just give you a little bit of the backstory here on Elijah. Elijah, he's this great prophet of God. He, God talks to him and God talks through him. I mean, he's just a great man in the Old Testament. And he shows up and he has this showdown with 850 false prophets where they do this sacrifice. And the false prophets try to get their gods to bring fire out of the heavens and consume the sacrifice. Well, of course, they fail because they were serving false gods. 850 false prophets and they were failing miserably. Couldn't get anything to happen. No outcome. But then Elijah comes along and he's almost just nonchalant about it. And he throws water on the sacrifice and he builds it up and he throws more water. And he says, bring more water. And he digs a trench just to hold the water against the sacrifice. And he says, God, hit it. Boom. Fire out of heaven, consumes the sacrifice. And what happens after that? Elijah wins the contest because God shows up. And so then he orders the execution of the false prophets. That's the way they rolled back then. If you didn't get an outcome from your prayer life, they ended up executing you. <laughs> it was hardcore. Immediately following that, God sends an abundance of rain, which was part of the curse that the people were under. And it ends the drought. When God talks, man, things happen. But Jezebel, who was the queen at the time, and her 850 prophets that she used to love going shopping with on Rodeo Drive, they're all gone. All their, their influence is gone. And Jezebel hears about it. And she's, she's not happy that God answered. She's actually upset that she lost her shopping buddies and they all got killed. So she sends a threat to Elijah that he's as good as dead when she gets her hands on him. Elijah takes this lie to heart. What happens to him? He takes the lie to heart and fear comes in. What chases the fear? Suicidal thoughts. And these suicidal thinking comes up in his mind because it's common thinking. The lies overpower him and he stops eating. He stops drinking. He wishes he could die. And an angel has to intervene and help him. So let's pick up the story here. First Kings chapter 19 verses 11 through 13. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord, listen, I want you to hear this. But the Lord was not in that wind, that destructive wind. And after the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in that destructive earthquake. Verse 12, and the earthquake and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in that destructive fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle stillness and a still small voice. Verse 13, when Elijah heard the voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> I love it. You know, God's not in all those destructive forces. You see, we, we often think just because there's an earthquake, just because there's a terrible fire or lightning, just because this happens or that happens, somehow, you know, uh, some destructive wave comes in that somehow that was God. And it says that God wasn't in any of that thing, any of that stuff, any of those natural disasters. Why do we attribute death to a God who is life? who is love, who cares for us. It's in the Word of God. You can see it right there in the Word of God. And God is in the still, small, communicative, intimate voice to Elijah. And he's basically going, Elijah, what in the world are you doing here? Why are you outside of my plan? Why are you out here wanting to die? Why are you wanting to commit suicide? What are you doing in this cave? You see, when you have no rest, when you are pursued, you start cave shopping for that rest. You try to get the rest yourself, even if it's in suicide. You know, some people, they cut themselves trying to get a release from the pain. It's almost like they're trying to lance a, a wound or lance an infection, trying to get the infection out of their life, out of their body. They're cutting themselves because it's it almost is a natural answer to a spiritual problem. But here's the thing is, it's a spiritual problem. It needs a spiritual solution, a spiritual lancing. And I want you to know something. Jesus was cut to relieve that pressure off of you. Jesus was wounded. He was pierced for you. He could do it. 
We can't, our cutting won't solve any of our spiritual problems. But Jesus was cut for you, my friend. Notice the cultural trend today that even is back in um, Elijah's day. For man cave, for she shed, he was a pursuit of isolation, of escape, trying to get that rest, that ease of mind by, oh, if I can just tune the world out and put the, the basketball game on for like nine hours and just isolate myself. Elijah was pulling the man cave thing. That's what he was looking for, an escape. When Elijah answers, he says something interesting to God. He says, God, I'm the only one left who serves you. And now the king's army is searching to destroy me. I got to go out. I had to go get me a man cave, right? I'm the only one left. Because I'm the only one left, I need a man cave. Because I'm all alone, I need to further isolate myself. I'm telling you, if, you, if you're pursuing isolation, if, you're pers if you think you need to pursue that, it's because at some place in your life, you're believing a lie. God answers Elijah back and he says, what are you doing here? He says, I still, God says to Elijah, I still have 7,000 men in Israel dedicated to me who have not bowed a knee down to those false gods. Wow, what a lie he had believed. He thought he was the only one. And God's saying, I got another 7,000 guys who are just like you, dedicated to me. They're true. Like I said, never build a doctrine on your experience or your perception of events. Elijah was building a false doctrine and getting into man cave shopping. Elijah had totally, 100% believed a lie. He believed Jezebel's threats over God's um, look, God performed a, a miracle, but he believed Jezebel's threats more than God's word. He believed he was alone, forsaken, isolated. He believed a lie. So isolation pursues more isolation, doesn't it? He was worried. He was anxious. He was stressed. He was sleep deprived. Elijah was a bona fide mess looking for a rest. Sometimes we need a bona fide rest so that we can deal with the mess. Are you a mess today looking for a rest? Jesus says this to you. Listen to the warm, love-filled words of Jesus right to you right now. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Notice what it doesn't say. Jesus didn't say, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you some more work to do as a volunteer in the ministry. I will heap loads of work. You, what you need is more work. I need you out evangelizing the world. I need you doing this. I need God. When, when you're broken, when, you, when you're sleep deprived, when you're rest deprived, Jesus calls to you and he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Do you know great miracles happen from the rest, from the place where it's non-performance on my part, but God's performance on his part. When we import the work of heaven into our life because we need him and because we are at the end of ourselves, God does amazing things when it's all about him and not about me, when it's not about you, when it's all about him. Signs and wonders don't cast down fear. Did you hear me? Signs and wonders don't cast down fear. They're good. They're a part of God's plan. But there is no substitute for the word of faith, for God's love message into your heart, for Jesus comforting you and giving you that rest. God can do wonders in your life, but that won't give you a good night's sleep. God can bless you. I know people that have had ridiculous blessings from God and they still are sleep deprived. If you believe a lie, a sign and a wonder won't remove that mental construct. You need the word of God, the love of God, ministered by the word of God to evict that fear. Not a sign and a wonder. You need, there's no substitute for the word of God. You will not be able to rest until you get that word, that word of peace covering your heart and mind. The lie must be evicted and replaced with truth. You've got to have truth in your heart. Until you know the truth, remember it's the truth that sets you free, not a sign and a wonder. You got to know the truth. You can't enjoy the rest until you get rid of that splinter of fear 
that lie, that deception in your heart. Perfect love casts down all fear. God is love, so God casts down all fear. 1 John 4, 18, let's look at it again. There is no fear in love. How much? None. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear brings torment. So the one who is afraid is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. And I told you before, please do not be condemned. Don't feel condemned when you hear that, like, oh, there we go again. I'm failing at the love thing. No, no. It just means that you've got more room in your heart for God's love. When you, If you have any fear in your life, you know you've got another compartment in your heart that can accept God's truth and His love to evict that fear. That's all you need to do. If you're struggling with any worry, anxiety, fear, care, know that you've got more room for God's love. That's how you approach it. Don't feel condemned. Jesus never condemns. He may convince you and turn the light on and say, hey, you got some fear there in your heart, but then you can go, oh, well, Lord, I just lay that fear down at the foot of the cross and I receive your love in its place. Thank you, Jesus. Did you know that God made it so that the brain, your brain, has a natural pharmacy available to it? Internally, inside of you, you've got a natural pharmacy for the brain. If you've ever read Dr. Carolyn Leaf's book, um, Who Switched Off My Brain?, you're, you would discover so many wonderful things about how God made you. God has given your brain a natural pharmacy. It has the power to release biochemicals like endorphins and serotonin. And the release of these biochemicals start a chain reaction that creates a positive environment where intellect flourishes, further promoting mental and physical health. That's a good thing. But when you give in to stress, thinking. Then you also release biochemicals, but not the good kind. A chain reaction occurs. You begin to feel frustrated. You start feeling fear. That releases more bad biochemicals. Now all of a sudden, anger, anxiety, bitterness, that releases more bad chemicals. They destroy your physical health. Research tells us, this is scientific, research tell us that fear triggers more than 1,400 known physical and chemical responses. And because of this, your hormones and your neurotransmitters are negatively affected. It affects your internal computer. The enemy's strategy is to rob you of rest. Rest is so important to your brain's health. The enemy wants to hijack your thinking. He wants you to have bad thinking. You see, it's tactical torture. Fear wants to steal your sleep so that the cerebral spinal fluid wash won't happen. It won't occur, and you just keep building up these toxic proteins. God has designed you to have that car wash in the middle of the night on your brain, but the enemy wants your brain swollen and toxic so that it can't get that cerebral spinal fluid wash. He wants to sabotage your DNA genes with death. The enemy wants to import storms into your thoughts all day and in the middle of the night. He cares more about the storms on the inside of you than the storms around you. So let's talk about another stormy sea that Jesus' disciples had. Remember, we had the one in part three where Jesus was in the boat sleeping and he didn't seem to care about the care, right? He cared about the disciples, but not the fear and the worry. He's like, what are, you, what are you so afraid about? Like, what's the deal? What's going on? Well, here's another storm you see, Jesus and the disciples, that's about Jesus and the disciples. But this one's a little different. It's got a little twist to it. I want to tell you about this one. Jesus had just fed the multitudes miraculously. I mean, another sign and wonder. It was a miracle. The disciples were like jaw dropped, you know, beautiful. And then Jesus says this to him in Matthew 14, 22. He says, get in the boat and go before me to the other side. Okay, pretty simple instructions. Get in the boat, go before me to the other side. Straightforward, right? Well, the problem is a huge storm arrives and comes against them while they're out on the water. This time, Jesus is not asleep in the boat. My friend, Jesus is not in their boat. But guess what happens? You know this story. You've heard about the story. Jesus comes walking to them on the water. So right away, of course, 
You and I are thinking, well, they're in the middle of a storm. This is terrible. They're, they're afraid. Oh, my goodness. There's no Jesus in the boat. And suddenly Jesus comes walking on the water. Well, of course, the disciples' response would be, oh, Jesus. Oh, it's so good to see you. everything's all right. It's OK. Hey, guys, let's relax. Here comes Jesus walking on the water, no less. This is wonderful, right? And so they were at perfect ease and peace, right? Because because miracles calm everyone, don't they? No, 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 no. Check it out. Go with me. Matthew 14, verse 26. Check this out. And when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, they were terrified. Some versions say they shrieked. <laughs> and they said, it is a ghost. And they screamed and shrieked out with fright. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, well, what's he going to say? I mean, it's an open-ended question. He said, if it's you, command me to come on the water. That's the only response that he wants. Well, Jesus, it, it is him, so Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat. He walks on the water toward Jesus. But when Peter saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand, caught him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then it goes on and says, and they were immediately, once Jesus got in the boat, they were immediately at their destination at the other shore. Can we please just keep it simple, folks? Jesus said, get in the boat, go to the other side. Notice how Peter's water walking miracle, event pursuing miracle, give me a sign and wonder, slowed down everybody, slowed the outcome of God's will and purpose down. Believers are supposed to live by faith, not by chasing signs and wonders. Signs and wonders, listen, they're wonderful. They're great. They're supposed to be a part. But listen, signs and wonders are supposed to follow the word, it's supposed to follow the preaching of the word, the teaching, confirming the word of God, not confirming that this is God. Jesus already said he spoke the word and he said, I am. Remember, that's what he said to Peter. He said, fear not to the disciples. I am, he said, be, take good courage, be, take courage, I am, don't be afraid. Take courage, I am, don't be afraid. Peter was looking for a miracle to confirm the identity of Jesus. That's a wrong approach. It's the wrong way. Even to this day, Peter never walked on water again that we know about. In fact, after Jesus had died on the cross, rose from the grave and was making fish cakes on the beach and Peter was out in the boat fishing and he identified that it was Jesus, Peter didn't jump out of the boat and walk on the water. Peter had to jump in the, in the water and swim to shore. We are chasing the wrong thing. Go after the word. If Jesus said, this is what it is, I am, take courage. Do what he said. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Recognize the identity of Christ. Don't be pursuing another miracle. Well, I, I got to somehow, maybe if I could walk on, see, see, it was back on Peter. Maybe if I could perform, maybe if I could just do this, well, then somehow, then I'll know it's real. Then, then I'll know this whole thing's that, that, that'll make my fear go away. It didn't, did it? And it didn't help the people in the boat. The fear factor was still going on. All they needed to do was just say, okay, Jesus, come on, get in the boat. Let Jesus in your boat. Get to the outcome. What are we supposed to be doing? Getting to the other side. Let Jesus in your boat. We don't need to see you walk on water to prove that Jesus is Jesus. What we need to do is get to the other side. We need to honor Jesus' word and his commandment. John Maxwell said this. He said, people who focus on their fears, they don't grow. They become paralyzed. Invite Jesus into your boat and quit trying to prove that you can do it. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you doing it. Stop laboring and be at rest. I told you before, great things happen when we're at rest. You know, the people of God in Israel, they got taken out of the promised land because they wouldn't enter into the rest. They wouldn't allow the land to be at rest. Rest is critical to your future. Quit trying to be super spiritual and make it about what you do 
and let's see what Jesus do, right? Be at peace, be at rest. So how do we enter that rest? If it's so important, it's by faith. But let me give you a very practical verse of scripture to complement this. Philippians 4 verse 8. Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. You see, this is how we live fear free. This is how we, how to put up the no fear here sign in your life. This is the practical that ignites the spiritual. Here's the oil. Now you flip the switch. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17 says. Faith comes by hearing, meditating on whatever is good, whatever is true. That's what he said, whatever is honorable, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, right? That's what we're supposed to meditate on. That's the rest that you have to labor to enter into. And faith is the antithesis of fear. I got to give it to you again. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given you and me a spirit of fear. No, no, no. But of power, of love, and of a sound mind. You see, you and I, we have a spiritual legal right to God's amazing thoughts. We have a legal right to the mind of Christ. And if you've received Jesus as your personal Savior, you get access to His thinking. So I know right now, I know right now there's a few of you, you're saying, Stephen, please, I got to get Jesus in my heart. I want to have legal right to God's thoughts, to God's thinking, to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be living fearful. I want to be faith filled. You want your marriage to work great? You need to have a faith filled marriage. People aren't, people don't move away from each other usually because they don't love each other. It's usually because they're not faithful. He wasn't faithful to her. She wasn't faithful to him. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You want your children to be faithful. If you don't want them to be fearful and be motivated by the fears of the, uh, the culture, then you need them to be faith filled. There's no substitute for the word of God. And Jesus is the word. John 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Jesus. So let's right now, quickly, let's receive Jesus into our heart. And then I'm going to teach you a prayer that you can pray how to live fearless and faithful. Pray this first. Jesus, I ask you to be my savior. You died on the cross for me. You paid the price to redeem me from the curse. Forgive me of all my sins. You've been raised from the grave. I accept you into my heart and I make you the Lord of my life. Amen. So now John 1, 12 says, to as many as received Jesus, to them God has given the power and the right and the privilege to be the sons and daughters of God. That's you. You've believed on the name of Jesus. Now, see, you can authorize this prayer for fearless and faithful living. Pray something like this. This is according to God's word, but pray this with me. Just say, Heavenly Father, I dedicate the arena of my mind to what is true, honorable, whatever is right and pure. Say this, I choose to think on what is lovely and admirable. My mind is a no fear here zone, dedicated to the glory of you, Father God. Thank you for reminding me that Jesus calls me to his rest. I honor him as I enter your rest. You remind me to obey, and that is better than sacrifice. There's power in your word. It's the force of your unfailing love. Say this now, I let go of all fear, all worry. I let go of all anxiety here at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Oh, my friend, that's exciting. I want to hear about you living fearless and faith-filled. You can do this with Christ in you. It's all about His work. He, remember what He told the disciples who were afraid in the boat? 
He said, take courage. Well, that's what you're doing. You're taking courage by taking the word of God. You're recognizing the great I am, Jesus, and you're living fear-free in his precious name. 